business consultant, political strategist. These are just a handful of the terms one could use to describe Nico Mealy, our speaker today. Born to foreign service parents in Ghana, which I just found out, he graduated from William and Mary College with a degree in government. He then worked for several high-profile advocacy organizations where he pioneered the use of social media as a force for fundraising. As webmaster for Governor Howard Dean's 2004 presidential bid, Mr. Mealy popularized the use of technology and social media that revolutionized political fundraising and reshaped American politics. He then founded Echo Dito, a leading internet strategy and consulting firm. When he's not teaching at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, he also serves on a number of private and nonprofit boards. Published earlier this year, his first book, The End of Big, How the Internet Makes David the New Goliath, explores the consequences of living in a socially connected society. Now, before I turn over the podium to Mr. Mealy, uh, I thought it'd be fitting that I offer a few of my favorite uh, tweets from his Twitter account. <laughs> Uh, I think they, they, uh, they show that Mr. Mealy shares a lot in common with those Exonians. On over November 19th, uh, Mealy writes, I drop my iPhone, crack the glass, waiting while it gets repaired. But without my iPhone, I feel unmoored, it is pathetic and scary. <laughs> On the morning of October 22nd, Mr. Mealy simply writes, must, period, have, period, coffee, period. <laughs> without further ado, Mr. Mealy. <laughs> Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come down. That would be funner. So, I look different, yeah, or you do. You definitely look different. I think the world changed in 1984. The good nerds among you remember. That's when Steve Jobs introduced the first Macintosh personal computer. That's not what I'm talking about. In 1984, a guy named Chuck Hall invented something called stereolithography. Today we call stereolithography 3D printing. I have a 3D printer. It sprays plastic into shapes. A few a few, oh, I need lights, yep, okay. I live uh, just outside of Boston in Lexington, and I have two little boys, five and three, and they tear through shoe sizes. And last April, we had our first really warm spring day, and I wanted the boys to wear sandals that summer. But I didn't want to put them in the car and drive them to the store and fit them with shoes, it just was going to be, take forever, be a disaster to the boys, never. And so instead, I downloaded off the internet the blueprints for sandals and printed them a pair of sandals each. And then they ran around with them outside, kind of like Crocs. And in fact, I've tried to keep one of my, my younger son outfitted in printed shoes that I've made all, uh, all summer long. I just printed I printed uh, the other yesterday that uh, dinosaur head because one of my boys is really into dinosaurs. So I'm going to bring it home as a little present for him. My 3D printer takes like a spool of plastic thread and sprays it into shapes that I download off the internet. It's entirely possible my boys will never go to a shoe store. That they'll never buy shoes. They may not even buy them online. When they need them, they'll just download them off the internet, blueprints, and print them. Which is kind of fantastic, kind of awesome. But about three days after I printed that first pair of sandals for my boys, a guy in Texas put up the blueprints to print all of the regulated pieces of an AR-15 assault rifle, and then all of the regulated pieces of an AK-47, and now all of the pieces of a working pistol. You just need to add two screws, like the kind of screws you get at any hardware store. And that's, that's a little scary. And I think of this story as capturing both the promise and the peril of our technology. It's both awesome and interesting. I can print shoes and 
I've always come my boys, thinking of my boys who now think, oh, whenever you want a toy, just tell dad and he'll print it for you. <laughs> right? My son the other day asked me if I could print him a toy tape here. But there's also the challenge of what does this mean to our traditional institutions? Is it possible to regulate the printing of guns? What does that even mean? How would we go about doing that? The argument I'm going to make to you today is that our technology pushes power to individuals out of institutions. And that, that has profound implications for all of our institutions. And that's why I look across in each chapter of my book, I look at, you know, um, big, what's the first big? Big news, big political parties, big government, big armies, even big fun, music, movies, publishing, across all of these industries, even across big manufacturing, the technology is challenging all of the assumptions about scale, all of the assumptions about establishment, because of the way that power is pushed to individuals. And it's actually not just a story of technology, it's also a story about how our institutions haven't done a good job. And so people are seeking alternatives. People are stepping outside of traditional institutions to try new ways of doing things. In my life, I spent an inordinate amount of time going to meetings. Meetings in Washington, D.C., in Capitol Hill, in the executive branch, corporate meetings, corporate board meetings, even Harvard faculty meetings. And I go to these meetings, and I listen to the people in charge talk, and I think, boy, you know, I don't think that's what the world's going to look like in a decade or two. I'm not sure I live in the same world. My people, the American nerd, they don't think like that. And I was trying to figure out how to articulate this, and I saw that movie, The King's Speech. Did anybody see that movie? Yeah. yeah. And so I, um, I didn't grow up in the United States, and I grew up in Asia, and I have pretty, pretty solid Asian history. I have like very, very light on the European history, other than they were colonialists. <laughs> and uh, I started reading up on uh, early European hi history, and I read that book, Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August, right? In 1910, King Edward VII dies, and it is the most opulent, probably the most opulent funeral in human history. Maybe the most opulent event in human history. Every nation in the world sends a representative. Approximately a hundred nations there. How many democracies? Three. Afterwards, King, the new King George of England, the Kaiser of Germany, the Tsar of Russia, they're writing each other letters in 1910 and they're saying, just imagine when our grandchildren are the monarchs of Europe and the colonies in 2013. And I just was like, in 1910, it's kind of like almost over already. But it, they can't see it from where they stand. And my fear and my concern about our institutions is that, that they are similarly blind to big changes in the structure of power. What do I mean, big changes in the structure of power? Well, if I was giving this speech to you 35 years ago and I was going to describe a computer, uh, I would, I would have described something like this, a Cray supercomputer. Earlier today in assembly, I was saying how it probably would fill this stage. It would fill this stage. 1975 Cray supercomputer. Base price, five million bucks. Only available to the world's largest institutions, to the most powerful militaries, biggest companies, and best funded universities. And today you can walk into any strip mall in America, and pretty much actually any store almost anywhere in the world, and for a couple hundred bucks, buy a computer as powerful, actually, depending on how you measure it, because it's not quite apples to apples, significantly more powerful than this machine. And the funny thing is, that's not an accident. Does anybody want to guess what year was the first graduate computer science program in the United States at a university? Anyone? 1945? No, too, too early. 1962. Where? 
Wisconsin. 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 Wisconsin.
uh, each episode of the Game of Thrones cost about six million bucks. And if you cut the price of that down, does it matter to you if the soundtrack is a real symphony orchestra or a, or a computerized one? Can you tell the difference? It doesn't matter to you. Well, I'm a nerd. I'm not sure it matters to me. Sorry. But, but I could see an argument of why it would matter for a case of artistic integrity or what have you. The other, the other side of it, the other question I found far more troubling is that in 1967, one of the highest gro uh, grossing films of the year was a film called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner about interracial marriage. It opened nationwide at a time when internet interracial marriage was illegal in more than a dozen states. And sure, we're in the middle of the civil rights movement, but it was also a way that Hollywood and the entertainment and cultural institutions of our time were trying to engage the public in this discussion trying to shape our thinking and our, and just get us to talk about these things. Public experience, shared cultural experience. And that's a, that's a far more troubling implication. But all told, in the movie's a movie, right? So I decided to look at higher education. Well, the, since 1980, the cost of a four-year college degree has skyrocketed. Its economic value has plummeted. The Department of Labor last year had a study that said 19% of parking attendants have completed a four-year college education and have the debt to go with it. I'm not sure the system is really working. Houston Community College, 80,000 students. Something about the way our whole system of higher education works, I think is failing. And at the same time, people are seeking alternatives. This is Sebastian Thrun. <coughs> Sebastian Thrun was a tenured professor of robotics at Stanford. The guy is genius and a famous teacher and exceptional. And two years ago, he announces he's leaving his tenured position at Stanford to teach online at this company, Udacity. And he says, I'd rather teach 150,000 students than 150. And I thought, he doesn't have to go to faculty meetings either. <laughs> Udacity now, in partnership with Georgia Tech, offers a completely online $7,000 master's degree in engineering. Just think about that the next time you drive across a bridge. <laughs> and I think that, on the one hand, I think our system of higher education really doesn't work well. And I'm encouraging people who are curious and opt out and seek alternatives and are trying to figure out other ways of doing this. But I also think that uh, I'm a teacher. I love teaching. I, I, I live for it, really. And I'm terrified about what happens if we lose a lot of the power, the power of credentialing, of authority, of, you know, do I want to see a heart surgeon who got their degree online? I'm not so sure, right? There's like a crucial role that higher education plays in our society, including basic research, right? <laughs> including basic research. It's a very important thread uh, that is in danger of getting lost institutionally about knowledge. And then there is work. This is a company, Local Motors, that crowdsources the design, the production, and the sale of automobiles. Hundreds, sometimes actually not more hundreds, thousands of people participate in the design. Different people print pieces. They have parties where they come together and assemble them, and then they sell them. That sounds kind of crazy and awesome, and uh, it raises all kinds of questions about safety, about work, about intellectual property. We're reaching a stage in the United States where almost. Uh, a little bit more than a third of the American population is self-employed. And a similar percentage works from home. We're talking about more Americans being self-employed. I don't mean, I, this, I'm just drawing a distinction between self-employed and contingent employment. Contingent employment is you work 36 hours a week at Walmart. No. Self-employed is truly, honestly self-employed. You run a small business, you do something else. That's more American self-employed than at any time since the Civil War era. 
1820, the vast majority of Americans, 80% plus, were employed in subsistence farms or small shops. By 1920, the pendulum swung the other way, 80% or more of Americans employed by large corporations. And we're swinging back the other way, although it's a little more complicated this time. But the very nature of work is different, is changed, of commuting, of offices, of availability. Cloud computing and this powerful technology that pushes power to individuals is really shaping, reshaping what jobs are, what work means. Gone is the nine to five. We are talking earlier about manufacturing and 3D printing and other alternatives to money. A whole host of changes are kind of just on the horizon. And of course this has implications for public policy, for social safety net, for retirement, for health care. And we're not, we're not, we can't figure out how to navigate all of this. If you want to see this in action, there's a really com interesting company called Quirky, Q-U-I-R-K-Y, where Everyone participates in the design, production, marketing, naming, and sale of the products. You can go and, is there a Bed Bath & Beyond someplace? You can go to Bed Bath & Beyond and find quirky products. And when you buy one and you open it, there's this giant brochure that folds out of the names of everyone online who participated in the creation and sale of the product. <laughs> it is staggering. Right? But the actual company quirky is quite small. Just a handful of employees. And beside, not, it's not just a challenge to the end of big business, it's also my favorite subject of all time, politics. We forget, right? Obama's been president for a while now. We forget <coughs> that he wasn't supposed to be president. Hillary Clinton had spent her entire life running for president. She'd been in the White House eight years as first lady. Her husband is arguably the most popular popular Democratic president, you know, certainly since FDR, and certainly possibly one of the most popular presidents of all time. <coughs> Virtually every member of the Congressional Black Caucus, I shouldn't say that, the vast majority of the Congressional Black Caucus had endorsed Hillary, not Obama. She was widely expected to win. Virtually every member of the press thought she was going to win. I went back recently and read the headlines for the eight weeks prior to the the, the New Hampshire primary. I won't mention that other Western state. <laughs> There's no expectation that Obama has a chance. The narrative is that Hillary is going to win. And yet, Obama manages to use the internet to build a fundraising force and a organizing force that is as powerful as the establishment Democratic Party that Hillary and her husband control. And, she, man, and she, she loses. She loses to a man who's been in public life less than a decade, which is stunning. This is a woman who spent, since she was 18, worked on every Democratic presidential campaign there was. It was completely unexpected and a shock to the Democratic Party. But this is not just the story of Democrats. If we think about the Tea Party, the last two Senate cycles have had 12 Senate Republican candidates uh, Senate Republican primaries where the establishment Republican candidate loses to the Tea Party insurgent, including three sitting U.S. Senators losing in their own primaries, which is effectively unprecedented in American history. The internet changes the, the playing field, makes it easier for insurgents to defeat incumbents renders the value of the establishment party less and less. Now part of that, in the case of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, is that the nature of the party kind of atrophied. There wasn't much of a local party anymore. I like to say they become cocktail parties for major donors, not real grassroots parties. And so if you're able to use the internet to organize a powerful force online, you can challenge them in a significant way. You can be competitive. And then there is the question of big government. I mentioned before my two boys, Ace and Tom, Asa and Tom, five and three, and these slides are near my house, and I love these slides, because you just run those little boys up those stairs 20 or 30 times, and they sleep very well. <laughs> That's right, boys, go on, yeah, do it again, do it again. And the hurricane comes along, big hurricane comes along, and tears these slides out of the, out of the park. 
And somebody puts up a, some parent starts a PayPal page and then prints up flyers and sticks them up around the park and says, the town says it's going to take three years and $35,000 to replace the slides. But if every parent who comes gives 50 bucks, we'll have the money in no time. And guess what? Boom, they raised the money. Three months later, we got the slides. It was fantastic. I was thrilled. There's, there's Tommy going down the slide. <laughs> Clutching his matchbox cars for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great story, right? The community comes together to pay for the slides. But it turns out there was a sewage problem in the neighborhood. And the reason why the, the, the local government said it was going to take three years is there was a priority. There were, there were things that had to happen first. And in fact, the fact that people went online and raised a bunch of money and demanded they build the slide had all kinds of implications for planning and budgeting. Now, I'm pretty sure that when a parent called the, the, the town, based on my own experience, and said, hey, you know those slides? They got an answer something like, well, collect 300 signatures and we'll give you five minutes, maybe three minutes, on the next agenda eight weeks out. There wasn't a real clear way to navigate the system, <laughs> so they just opted out. They started a PayPal page and printed up a bunch of flyers. It was way easier. And at the end of the day, that's, that's the kind of gap I'm concerned about. Our technology is taking off in this dramatic direction with great speed and excitement and intensity, and our institutions are moving at a totally different pace, frequently in a totally different direction. So what are we going to do about it? What is to be done? It's a little scary. Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to rethink our relationships with the people that we lead. You are not an audience. You are the former audience. All of you could whip out your iPads, iPhones, Androids. You could go on Facebook or Twitter, you could say, ah, that Nico, not so good. Ah, I'm unimpressed. Ah, I heard it all before. Well, I don't think it's real. Even more devastating, that'd be pretty devastating. <laughs> Even more devastating, you could go on Amazon and you could give my book one star. And if everybody in this room gave my book one star without reading it, it would demonstrably affect the sales of my book. Right? Amazon pays attention to those kinds of algorithms. The audience is not the audience. They actually have more power than I do. And I think this is true in all kinds of relationships as leaders. As a teacher in my classroom, I totally find this. The students have an enormous amount of power. Uh, you know, they all the time will Google something I'm saying while I'm saying it to prove I'm wrong. <laughs> this creates some accountability. It's kind of an interesting dynamic. But it's also really challenging to leadership. So the first step begins with understanding recognizing the power people carry around with them, the enormous individual power of social media, and then thinking about the people we lead and the ways to shape our expectations and the way we talk to them to acknowledge that. You may have noticed that one of the first slides I had my Twitter handle. I'm saying, you can talk to me. Next thing we can do is we can combine top-down leadership with the distributed power of the individual. I've talked about this a little bit this morning in assembly. Two examples. First example is the Obama campaign. It's an exciting example, right? The Obama campaign, in a traditional political campaign, you have a standard org chart, and at the bottom of the org chart, you draw a red line. And all the jobs under the red line go to volunteers. Because it's hard to trust volunteers with important things. On the Obama campaign, they move the red line way up the org chart. And they do that, they do that because they're able to bring integrity to it with a combination of culture and technology. Culture. There's an interview process. You submit your resume, you get reviewed online, you might have a couple of phone screens, you have a face-to-face -face interview. And then in 08, not they did a different process in 2012, but in 08 they hand you not quite a contract, but a statement of principles you were going to agree to. 
They want to say, this is an important job and we're giving you a lot of responsibility. You have to hold up your end of the bargain and here is what it is. And then you might not ever see a human being again. They manage you through online tools and assess whether you're going to your goals and getting your job done. Computational management. And then the other side of the equation, the other story, is the story I told this morning about the Boston bombing. About how a group of people go on the internet and they have all this power on their person and they want to do something. An impulse I respect and encourage. But what do they do? They launch their own investigation into who the bombers might be and choose the wrong guys. They come up with the wrong suspects. Ruin a couple of people's lives. We have to give people process. We have to channel that energy and that power they have into systems that have integrity, into systems that deliver good results. And I was talking about this this morning in assembly that there are seven companies that essentially control our online lives. Amazon, Apple, eBay, Facebook, Google, Skype, which is how Microsoft sneaks in, and Twitter. And never before in American history has so much public space been privately owned. And during the Boston bombing, there were all these rumors flying around Twitter. And I thought Twitter had, a, had an obligation, had a civic and moral obligation to say, if you want definitive information about what's going on, you can follow the Boston police or the FBI Twitter feed or the mayor's, Mayor Menino's Twitter feed. But they didn't do that. We have to demand accountability for them. They're all pretty new companies. They're not that old. It took newspapers somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 75 years to understand their responsibilities, the, the work they do in the public space. These companies are just beginning to understand what that might mean to be, to have that kind of, be custodians of the public space, the public sphere in that way. And then the, my last suggestion is that we have to go local. We have to get more involved in our communities. That I think traditionally, traditional ways of thinking about institutions and enforcing values, enforcing rules. I'm not sure how work, how well they work in the individual age when people can opt out, when people can go online and be disruptive. And we have to go back to local community. We have to really build deep and engaging relationships with our neighbors to revitalize our democracy, to change the federal government, change begins at home. We have to get involved. In some ways, I think of the last 75 years of the story of how television and air conditioners took Americans away from their neighbors, and the internet is bringing them back to their neighbors. And that's what makes me most hopeful about the future of democracy. But ultimately, this comes down to you. This comes down to you. I love, I'm a nerdy computer programmer, but I love poetry. So I thought I'd, I'll take your questions, but I thought I'd end with, uh, with a poem. And uh, we're approaching the year's end, so I thought of uh, Thomas Hardy. Right? Thomas Hardy was this great Victorian novelist, in a sense, right? He wrote Tess and the Dubervilles, Jude the Obscure, and he he lived through an era of tremendous change. I mean, in Thomas Hardy's life, they invented <laughs> electricity, <laughs> right? And the machine gun. It was just a huge era of change. And uh, he's, I think he was in his 80s, maybe someone else knows, in 1899. December of 1899, he's in his 80s, and he's lived through this tremendous change in his lifetime. And he's thinking about the end of the century. And he writes this poem, The Darkling Thrush. I leaned upon a coppice gate when frost was specter gray, and winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled bind stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres. And all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. 
The land's sharp features seem to be the century's corpse outlined. The crypt has crypt the cloudy canopy, the wind his death lament. The ancient pulse of German birth seems shrunken hard and dry, and every spirit upon earth seems fervorless as I. At once a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead, a full-hearted even song of joy illimited. A darkling thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, with glass beruffled plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So little cause for caroling of such ecstatic sound is written on terrestrial things afar and nigh around that I could think there whispered through his handsome good night air some blessed hope whereof he knew, and I, oops, I was unaware. I think of that poem because we are in this time of tremendous change. These institutions are so fragile, this technology is so powerful, and it can seem frustrating. It can seem gloomy. We're not sure where this is all going. Where we're hurtling at such enormous speed. And yet, there's great hope out there. And I have to say, it was one of the greatest things about being here today. It was talking to students and seeing their own excitement and hope. I was right, all of you. <coughs> you too. <laughs> so thank you for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions for as long as they let me talk. distributed, diffuse world, but that's not to say there aren't opportunities for leadership. In the Obama campaign, there was a small handful of people, Obama, David Plouf, David Axel, there was a small handful of people making those decisions and communicating them, pushing them out. But I think that that kind of failed them once they got inside the government to some extent. That the, the our institutions can't figure out how to, how to use a lot of this power, this diffuse power. And in the process, we're also creating some new, some new power, right? I mean, those companies all carry an enormous amount of power. Google, in many ways, shapes our public consciousness by shaping what happens when you search for a person's name or a term. And that has tremendous implication. So that's a little bit of a paradoxical answer. <coughs> yes, sir. I don't remember which company it was, but in today's news on NPR, they talked about I think it was one of these petitioning or asking the government to stop taking their information from all of us and giving it to the NSA. Did you hear that today? In the yeah, so uh, pretty much, I think every company on this list, every company on this list has been giving uh, our private data to the NSA. I shouldn't say our private data, our personal data to the NSA. Twitter is the one that has been actually most vocal um, most vocal uh, about protecting your data. Uh, but all of them essentially have been handing this data over. And now, uh, now they're getting angry about it. But I don't know, it's been going on for four or five years. I'm not sure why they didn't raise a bigger fuss when it started happening. It's like once everybody found out, they got embarrassed. Mm -hmm. yes, but isn't that the cycle, the human cycle? We have innovation that comes out front. There's some people start to use it, and then eventually checks and balances come in and adjustments get made, and hasn't that happened all through history? Yeah, yes, you could certainly make that argument, and I think there's some truth to that, but uh, that doesn't happen without consequence. You know, uh, the last cycle, if you want to say World War I through World War II, came at a tremendous cost. 
And uh, when I think even about the, you know, the Roman Empire collapses, and we have the, I'm kind of, this is a gross abbreviation exaggeration <laughs> history, but the Roman Empire collapses and we have the Dark Ages. We forget how to make cement for about a thousand years. And uh, when I look at the way I feel like knowledge and science and, um, and higher education are struggling in different ways, when I look at the nature of credentialing and authority, I think we're in danger of potentially losing some very important things here. And so the, you know, there's certainly a cyclical nature to it, but let's, let's do it with as little, like, catastrophic cost as possible. I also think, I also think that we have to get out of, uh, we have to get out of a, you know, a carbon-based economy and infrastructure, and to get out of oil to avert the catastrophe of global warming. We need really significant systemic change. And part of what's <laughs> happening is a cycle that's going to get us to that change. Yes, sir. Well, if we're going to get out of this, this common based world, how are we going to get away from the problem where people are short term oriented rather than being long term oriented? And we have people who seeking the lowest cost at this moment and then are yeah. worrying about what's going to happen in <coughs> five years or whatever. But that's why I want to drive us back to our communities. I want us to get us back to really knowing our neighbors' names. You know, this is Robert Putnam bowling alone, right? The yeah. same number of Americans bowling in 1950 as in 1990, but in 1950 they bowl in neighborhood leagues, in 1990 they bowl alone. And that, that decline in the connective tissue of community changed the value equation for politics, for economics, for the way we think about our communities in a way that I think was kind of in some ways deeply corrosive. The thing to me about the internet is the way it reverses that. Or the way I look at things like meetup.com, right? Uh, where Americans are organizing the meetup with their neighbors on all kinds of random things. I walked into a I walked into a library and there were 80 people there were knitting. I said, what's this? They said, oh, it's the knitting meetup. What a great way to get to know your friends, your neighbors, to try and rebuild the connective tissue that might change the value equation, the way we make decisions and judgments about our lives personally and our communities. We'll go back here, yeah? Uh, you talk a lot about how it's changed the landscape in the last five or 10 years with social media, but how do you think this will be affected as the next generation gets in, into jobs? Are some of these problems going to fix themselves? I mean, I learned how to type and do a Google search in first grade, which is definitely different than a lot of the um, adults here. So the people that grow up in this culture, um, are they going to fix some of these problems? Do you, uh, when you think about your career and work life, how many employers do you think? Do you think you'll have one employer? I mean, uh, it's interesting you say it because I think most Americans don't think they'll have one employer for the bulk of their lives. Oh, oh, uh, for the bulk of my life, probably not. I see yeah. myself as being the employer. You see, when you first got a college, you're like, well, yeah, you see what? I see myself as being the employer. I see yourself as being the employer. <laughs> I mean, I think that. Um, <coughs> I lost track of your question. Can you get into it one more time? I said just uh, as the next generation comes into the workforce, there are a lot of the, the problems you discussed about the institutions not being caught up with the media are going to sort of fix themselves as this media is sort of inherent to the younger generation's culture. I don't think it's going to fix itself unless you decide you're going to fix it. It's like if you don't live intentionally, if you don't make these decisions with intention, they will happen to you. You know, I believe purpose equals power. And if you come to things with purpose, you affect change. And if you don't, then you are swept along and change. And so I think it's not, I wouldn't assume that just because you grew up this way, that will carry itself with you. 
I think you have to. I think you have to have more agency than that, because otherwise you might end up some places you don't want to be. I used this example earlier, uh, and at some point of the the MIDI file format (MIDI), which for many years was the dominant music format on the internet. But in order to make it a small file size, the computer programmer who designed it essentially lopped off some tonality ranges on both ends that he didn't like that much and got a range he liked. And that meant for a long time all of our ringtones for our mobile phones that you couldn't have a you couldn't have Beethoven's you couldn't have a Beethoven ringtone because some programmer one day had decided he didn't want all those tones in there. Right? And you have to like come to some intention to change that. Otherwise, your world is going to be shaped in that direction without you ever choosing it. And it's not, it's not too late to choose what this looks like. In fact, there's plenty of time. Yes? I teach, and one of the things I want to, uh, to make sure I do well enough is to encourage my students to imagine the future. Because I'm worried that if they are only hoping to get a good job and have a good life, we're going to lose our creativity for imagining our future. So how would you as a teacher encourage this in your students? Uh, oh man, that's a hard question. Uh, well, I, I go back to literature, but that's my only option so far. I mean, I, I, it's harder for me to figure that out in a classroom and more for me to think about it in terms of my own children. I mean, like, I want, I'm, I'm clear what I want for my children, right? To be kind, to be curious, and to be hardworking. I don't really care if they're happy. <laughs> as long as they're kind, curious, and hardworking, they will have a, a very good life. And so, the kind, you know, <laughs> Is right now, at least the age of my boys, is a little bit of carrot, a little bit of stick. <laughs> the uh, the hard working is some combination of example and encouraging that way of thinking about the world. But the curiosity is the hardest part, right? Because I think curiosity kind of in part lends itself to imagination, right? To imagining what what, what does this mean? What does the future mean? Curiosity is a is a gateway to imagination in that in that sense. And, uh, you know, I'm a good nerd, and one of the things I love most is great science fiction. is deeply imaginative, right, about what the world could be and what the world means. I could rattle off to you right now a dozen really provocative, interesting science fiction titles, right? Um, the Wind-Up Girl, about the future of, of bio, bio manufacturing and climate change and energy. Um, uh, Quantum Thief, about... Uh, identity, uh, connectivity, and time. Uh, the uh, Embassy Town, uh, which is a great science fiction novel about an alien race that has that doesn't understand, that can't do metaphor, and the way that shapes how they think about the world, which is actually, I think, an allegory for social networking. If you if you if you live without metaphor. Right? If you can only understand things by doing. And so there's all kinds of exciting things happening in science fiction that, that kind of spark the imagination and drive it. Those are just a few. Those are just a few. <laughs> I'll give about that for way too long. So um, you said earlier that you know a lot about quite a bit about the city in history, or Asian history in general. Um, I was wondering if that sort of translated into like, knowledge of modern day um, Asia and how the internet affects life there and how life is affected, how life affects the internet there, especially in China with censorship. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to talk about that because basically I came to America when I was 18 and got obsessed with American politics. But um, I know a little bit about that just because I have to teach this stuff and have some cursory knowledge. David King is a professor at Harvard who has a big new study out about censorship in China that is quite interesting. Because what he finds is the Chinese don't censor criticism of the government. They censor any attempt to meet face to face. 
They do not want assembly. Criticism of the government turns out pretty useful to find out what's frustrating people. If, you, if they don't have a traditional democracy in elections, it can be hard to figure out what's, what's upsetting people. And so online criticism is turning into a very nice kind of release valve or way of assessing public sentiment. But you better, even if you said, oh, even if you, they experimented, they did things like, oh, let's all meet and walk our dogs. Nothing political about that. Boom, censored. They do not want any public assembly. And so, um, now, here's the thing. There's all this talk about the Great Firewall of China, etc. I, I think at the end of the day, it, you know, I think at the end of the day, the internet wins. I'm not sure you can persist. I mean, they're employing, he also has an estimate, and I do not remember what it is, but it's some lunatic number of full-time censors. It's like three million, three million some, some like unimaginable number of people reading everything being published online. But that's a losing proposition, right? And I'll just give you one, one data point to explain why, why that's a losing proposition, is that if you take all of the knowledge, all of the information, not knowledge, all the information ever created by humans, start with cave paintings, and do everything, printing press, photos, movies, TV, newspapers, but everything from the like, beginning of time up until about three years ago, that's how much information is created every 48 hours today. That's just like a, you can't keep up with that pace. And so any attempt to censor or manage that, I think is, is ultimately doomed, even if they win for a decade. Does that answer your question? Do I think government has the right to control and manipulate social media in times of unrest? Let's not forget the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom two years ago saying in the middle of London riots, we ought to shut this internet thing down. That's really the problem. I mean, I think that um, That just feels like a tremendously slippery slope. That feels to me like if our institutions don't have the integrity to navigate unrest and deal with people's anger or, or frustration with the system, and our only hope is to is to is to <coughs> suppress. That's that's like a, that's a that's not very good for. I don't like that. That's not good for the world. Right? We need to have ways of, I mean, the purpose of democracy in some sense is to manage a broad coalition of interests and conflicting considerations peacefully in a process. All politics is process. All politics is process. It's a process of opposing views coming to some conclusion. And so if we start to suppress ways of doing it, I know it's disruptive. I know it's disruptive, but we have to figure out ways to use it to our advantage, to channel that energy into the process, rather than try and shut it down. Because shutting it down is just like a hole in the dike and another one will pop out, if that makes any sense. Whack them all. No, it makes it all one another worse. <laughs> um, so from what I understand, you're saying that, uh, for example, big government should use the power of the internet connectivity to be and harness that energy in order to sort of make their structure more um, accessible to people. Yes. But um, if, if that's the, if, but if that connectivity is also what can bring power down, what can bring big government or big culture down, why on earth would they want to make themselves more accessible? Isn't that also exposing themselves to more exposing themselves to more damage? It's going to happen no matter what. If these institutions aren't doing their job and people are frustrated. They will either wrap around them or find a way to bring them down. So, so, so you, you, can, you can plug your ears and ignore it, but it's coming for you anyway. And so the smart thing to do is figure out how to use it, how to like take it and, and give it vehicles of integrity. This is like, in, it was like, the, within a day of the Boston bombing, I said, if they don't catch these guys in 24 hours, the internet is going to have a witch hunt. 
it's, it makes sense to me. People have this power and they want to do something. So how does that do they harness that energy then? Well we have to fit we have to we have to figure out new ways of giving them some greater role of participation in the process. Okay? <laughs> that's not an easy thing. I'm not saying that that's like pulling a you know rabbit out of the hat, but we have to figure out how to do it. In the case of you know the investigation, I could see a bunch of ways you might have tried to open it up a little bit more and get people's participation and help in a way where you could channel that energy mostly in a very useful direction rather than in a dispersed mob-like, you know, well, mob justice, mob rule. I'm going to stay on the student side for a minute. To follow up on that, if yeah, I may, yeah. uh, I thought it was Edward Snowden that recently released information about the kill switch on the internet that may have been invoked in the uh, Boston bombing. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that or do you know about that? Um, do you not want to say? <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't know enough about it, but the little I read about it didn't read like an NSA, you know, fantasy rather than an actual reality. There are, look, are, are, there ki uh, are there kill switches? I wouldn't say kill switches. There are what you might call single points of failure, right? Let's go back to the earlier question, Mubarak in Egypt. He gets really upset about this. He calls Vodafone and says, shut down all the cell phone towers. Not cell phones, mobile phones. Big difference. Shut down all the mobile phone towers. Vodafone shut down the mobile phone towers. Well, a few things happened. One, that unintentionally pushed people into the streets to figure out what was going on because they weren't getting updates via their phones anymore, which is not exactly what he was planning. It also had a crippling effect on, had a, I shouldn't say crippling, it had significant economic consequences. But most interesting to me is it started a whole raft of attempts to build what they call mesh networks or dark nets which are communication networks that are um, uh, completely peer-to-peer -peer without single points of failure, rendering kill switches ridiculous. Any note will tell you the idea of a kill switch is pure <coughs> fantasy. Like, there are ways you could get kind of close, but nerds will totally figure out alternatives or ways around it. Stay back here. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about 3D printing, is that something, is the 3D printer something like at Harvard that you could go use or do you have your own in your house? If so, is that something that you foresee like every American family might have one at home? And if so, how is that going to affect businesses? Like you could, why, why would you even go to stores anymore if you could just print everything? Here, this is the one I printed for my boys, the dinosaur. It's a, uh, we can pass around. It was a thousand bucks to buy it. I had it in my house and my wife got cranky because it was a little bit noisy. It's about, the, it's a little bit larger than a microwave. So a thousand bucks a little bit larger than a microwave. Well, you know, that, a laser printer was a thousand bucks ten years ago. A microwave oven was a thousand bucks thirty years ago. Inside the next ten years, I mean a lot of the significant patents in 3D printing expire in 2014. And so I fully anticipate cheaper and cheaper 3D printers hitting the marketplace. And I bought mine because I wanted to see how close is this to like something my mother would use. How close is this to a real household consumable device? And um, the answer is it's still kind of nerdorific. You still kind of have to really tinker with it. But it reminded me of the first time I got on the internet with a modem. And getting on with a modem in the ancient old days, this is like, <laughs> probably, what year were you born? 1990. <laughs> yeah, see, this is like 19, well, the first time I got on the internet was like 1992, okay? And it was really a pain in the butt to get on the internet. It was really hard, and you had to be kind of a super nerd to do it. But it was cheap to do, relatively cheap. And once you got on, you were like, or at least I was like, whoa, this changes everything. This is awesome. And so that's the experience of my 3D printer. Still kind of like hard to use. If you bought one and took it home, you'd, you'd get frustrated. But 
low spitting distance from uh, the, the model I the model I printed this dinosaur on is now being sold at every Staples for a thousand bucks. Maybe I think twelve hundred is how Staples is priced now. So mm -hmm. the, the now as my wife says, exactly why is it useful? <laughs> <laughs> I can print dinosaurs, <laughs> print shoes. I tried our dishwasher broke. I tried printing a replacement part, which is a disaster. That ended up with a giant plumbing bill. <laughs> <laughs> More due to my stubbornness than to any failure of the technology. Uh, the one I have printing is uh, basically it's a corn corn starch based plastic, so it's biodegradable, it's compostable, uh, but it is uh, but it's still plastic. Uh, but there are more complicated 3D printers, not really 3D printers if you get it like this is a pen somebody printed for me and it's made of metal, which is really more, this is not so much 3D printer, more what they call fabrication, on-demand fabrication. This is a, you know, an old-fashioned lathing machine just with some fancy robotics. Yes, in the back. You. Yeah. Uh -huh. You mentioned uh, the possibility of Not in the near future. Oh, well, not in the near future, but you mentioned someone had an inch to put blueprints up. So should that ever be possible? Do you see a like, usable way for the government to... It actually is possible. Mm -hmm. The guy put him up. It's called Defense Distributed. He had about 300,000 downloads in the first two weeks. And then something happened, which I have to investigate exactly what happened, but he took them down. Now, it actually doesn't matter if he took them down, because they were down all over the internet and pretty easy to find. Uh, my next project, once I have a little more time, is actually to print on my printer one of these pistols, just to prove it. Which might get me kicked out of Harvard. <laughs> but, because um, uh, I'm just curious as to how hard it is, it really. Does that answer your question? The, the U.S. government, I think, has passed a law, or certainly some municipalities and states have passed laws saying you're not allowed to print 3D weapons. But if I have the 3D printer in my house and I download the blueprints, there's no, they can't, it's very difficult to regulate that. I'm not sure that, I think that's effectively beyond enforcement. Okay. Um, my question is sort of linked to this and also linked to Lily's question about China. If you can't really censor the internet, and if you can't really limit um, you know, 3D gun parts, then how does that affect intellectual property rights? Because if you can't, if you're an artist and you're producing something to be sold. How does that affect intellectual property rights? So I answered this question a little bit in the assembly this morning, right? That um, when in the 70s, when the nerds were debating, 60s and 70s, when the nerds were debating file systems, how it really was more like the mid 60s. Uh, when the nerds are debating how should file systems work, what is a file, when they were designing early computers, what is a file, there was actually the raging debate, should the creator of a file have exclusive control over it? And they said, no, no, you can't have that. That scientific knowledge deserves to be free. And, um, you know, even even in the early days, this was, this goes back in the history of science and philosophy. You know, uh, Popper and Bertrand Russell. These are all people talking about: does scientific knowledge does it need to be free? Should it necessarily be free? And so, all of that came to bear when they were designing file systems, and they said, "There's this argument." They said, "No, the creator can't have control. That you have to make files." free to share. Because there were alternative proposals for file systems that would let the creator decide whether or not a file got copied, whether or not a file got opened. And so I think that those decisions have effectively been made. And we're dealing with the fallout of them now. And I you know I have a 3D printer, I also have a 3D scanner which cost about 1500 bucks. And there's a new 3D scanner I just bought. It hasn't come yet. It fits on your iPad. Um, just to give you an idea, you point it at something and it scans a 3D image of it that you can send to your printer. You can essentially photocopy, you know, items. And I experimented with this uh, with these shoes. My wife's friend had these shoes my wife liked. 
So I took them home and I scanned them and then I printed them, except that my wife didn't want to wear them in yellow plastic. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I think that has profound implications for intellectual property. If you, get, if you want to get even crazier, you think about it in terms of like organic manufacturing, right? I just, I just, for seven bucks, ordered a bunch of vials of my DNA, just because I was curious how hard is that for them to print my DNA and send it to me. It's really cheap, but what does that mean? And, you know, there's all kinds of interesting uh, and dangerous, both exciting and terrifying implications for that. But certainly a profound one is we've got to rethink how we think about intellectual property. And we have to rethink what do, what do we expect of the creative person today? I love poetry. I can uh, go online and find just about any poem I ever want without paying for it. Uh, when I was writing my book, the hardest part of writing my book was I have in front of each chapter I quote a favorite poem. And I had to go through and get the rights to these poems. And I had one author, one poet, refuse to give me the rights, just because he didn't want to. So I couldn't use his 10 words from his poem. I couldn't use it, right? Uh, which I kind of respected in a weird way, I don't know. Uh, but that, that, took, that took months of work to track down who owned the rights to the poem, because sometimes it wasn't clear who owned the rights, then to get permission and then to negotiate a price for me to use two to the eight sentences in my book. And that's an example of the way the old system of managing copyright or intellectual property is not working well in the digital age, right? And we don't have any good alternatives. We've got no good alternatives now. Is it worth it then for the government to try and, you know, limit maybe the downloads of movies or music or books or something like that? So there's some pretty interesting research on in trying to evaluate the if de illegally downloaded material actually reduces purchases. Because it's not clear, and there's, there's some very provocative data to suggest that illegally, do illegally downloaded material actually increases exposure and consequently might increase purchasing value. I'm not sure I entirely believe that, but it's interesting to look at. What is a lot more interesting is, uh, you know, what you might call value-based pricing, right? So Radiohead is a big band, and they make a new album, and they say, we'll give this album to you. You can choose what you want to pay. You can pay nothing. You can pay $1,000. You can pay $10,000. You, you tell us what the album is worth to you, right? Uh, and they say they made more money than on any album they'd ever made before and sold. Or Louis C.K., right, who says it's five bucks to buy my latest comedy special, and then he has a 2,000-word rant about why you damn well better pay the five bucks and not steal it from me because this is my freaking money, and I, this is like I've struggled through poverty as an obscure artist to do this, and you really owe me that five bucks because it's not going to matter that much to you. Right? And we're just beginning to see, it's, I'm stunned it took so long to get so much experimentation on compensation of artists and creative, but it's not going to look anything like the old system of that, I'm quite confident. You know, yeah. Yes? not falsely accused of being the bomber. And every single time a threat appeared about identifying the bomber, they had to go to court to have it removed. So they weren't really able to ever get it removed. So my question is, I guess, how much of the responsibility belongs to these companies? And how much of it does the legal system have to deal with? And can the legal system keep up with this? And how would that actually work? Boy, that is an interesting question. I don't know quite how to answer it. There is something I'll tell you. Look at uh, the Barbara Streisand effect. There are these photos. Somebody might know the story better than me because I'm going to screw it up. But I think the story is there were like these photos of Barbara Streisand renovating. She was renovating her house or something like that. And somehow these photos got leaked on the internet. And she went crazy with lawyers suing all over the place. 
And what happened? More and more people started posting and sharing the photos, <laughs> making it impossible for it to ever shut the photos down and get rid of them. Right? And it's become, they, the nerds came up with a name for the Barbra Streisand effect. And, uh, another, another kind of significant way it happened is a very interesting thread in kind of internet history, which is the Church of Scientology had some videos, internal videos get leaked. And they also were legally very aggressive trying to get them taken down. And all that did was lead to their proliferation and more and more people seeing them. And they got so aggressive legally that it led to uh, really kind of all interesting evolution. The Hacker Collective Anonymous really organized itself as a political entity out of this fight with Scientology to like really annoy them to keep these videos always up and available somewhere all the time front and center. And so this gets back to the question of, I think this is kind of in the same boat as um, the question about regulating the printing of 3D guns. You know, I think some of what's happening is beyond our, our normal institution abilities to enforce. And we have to figure out other ways of creating uh, community norms and, and, and enforcement vehicles that are, that are different from our existing ones. Because the dynamic of the internet, I think, can be a real rabbit hole in chasing these things down. It's sort of a follow-up to that. Uh, we're talking about the seven big companies that own all of our social media space. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on crowdsourced accountability. After the, uh, three days after the uh, marathon bombing, I was on the west coast, my wife was in Spain, and our daughter was locked down in Alston, a few blocks from where the police were staging the uh, search for the, the bomber. And I was watching every news channel I could find on a hotel TV and talking to my daughter on the phone. And I discovered that Twitter was self-correcting a lot more rapidly than the major news networks. That a rumor was quashed almost immediately on Twitter and was still out there two hours later on CNN. Um, isn't, isn't there a chance that, that the institution doesn't have to do the accountability totally if the rest of the internet is involved well, in that certainly process. certainly one of the things I want out of institutions is to use the power of the people who participate in them, right? When I talk about rethinking your audience, it's exactly like we got to figure out how to tap people's uh, ability to participate in better ways. I'm stunned that, that, that news organizations don't do more of this. The most forward thinking of it is The Guardian that's pretty aggressive about this, about asking people to help with investigations. But in terms of crowdsourcing and self-correcting, I mean, you know, Twitter, the week of the Boston bombing, was this really fascinating thing, which was both, which was this paradox of both aggressively self-correcting and sometimes really terribly wrong and not self-correcting. And so, um, you know, in some ways I'm still struggling to think about how to figure out how to think about that. One thing I'm sure of is that um, Twitter could provide just a little bit more structure or process to help the swarm be better corrected, right? And, um, and that the thinking about ways we can build systems or process to get better results, better integrity out of the crowd is really an essential and important task. And we know a lot about it in a bunch of ways. Um, I'm fond of saying we have almost 15 years of data on it out of the private sector in one way or another. You know, Wikipedia has done a great job of figuring out how to build a system with some integrity, but also take advantage of the wisdom of crowds. And so, the, the, the challenge is that I don't think we're very intentional about this. I don't think we come at it with enough consideration because it's so new. Because I think essentially because it's so new. 
And so is that part of the future? Undoubtedly. I will tell you that I lived, I lived right near where they caught the guy. And uh, it was breathtaking to watch it happen on Twitter. Hmm. Where, and the news and the TV were useless. The radio, I was listening to the radio, so, but Twitter was like how you understood exactly what was going on. And it was, I think it was a watershed moment in American history. I, um, I, I had the house on Google Maps based on Twitter feed yeah. uh, when TV was nowhere near there, but yes. Well, I like saying that like, you know, if I say uh, JFK gets shot in Dallas, pretty much everybody, even people not alive then, can tell me that Walter Cronkite, what did he do? He took off his glasses, right, and he cried. And if I say Watergate, Woodward and Bernstein is like the next thing out of people's mouths. And if I say the Berlin Wall coming down, people have these images of CNN, right, and the wall coming down. And if I say 9-11, some people have the image of the tower. A lot of people remember Rudy Giuliani doing two press conferences a day. And now another kind of significant cultural watershed moment is the killing of Osama bin Laden, which most Americans found out about via social media. Uh, and that was a harbinger of things to come because then we get to the Boston bombing and the thing is like totally living online in good and bad ways. You know, Boston Globe basically turned their homepage into a curated Twitter feed, which is a fascinating decision on their part. And so uh, I still think it was, I still think it was kind of a re remarkably It was remarkably naive and poorly suited to the time. I kind of thought we understood more about how this worked, at least in an institutional way, that we'd be better prepared for it. And yet, we didn't seem to be. And when I say we, I mean our society, some news organizations, the law enforcement. It felt like there were ways that we could have done a much better job of using social media to navigate. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm kind of interested in how you come to your conclusion. Because um, you talk about sort of the nerd vanguard in the past giving us more, giving the individual technology, making us more independent, giving us more power. Um, today, there are a number of, I guess you could, yeah, the same nerds of this era are anarchists creating things like Bitcoin, um, like the currency that's independent of banks or regulations or creating a Silk Road, like a black market online that's also anonymous, um, which has been closed down. But so you have one trend of the nerds sort of being more increasingly independent of any government. And then in response, you have the federal government passing perhaps increasingly vague statutes in a futile attempt to censor people. And then the, the old backup is create, creating like a more militarized security state and like the NSA watching us and things like that. So, but your final, so I see sort of two, these two ideologies going, opposing each other and going different directions. Your final conclusion is that democracy, like that this technology in the future, you know, that democracy will be stronger in the end. So I guess democracy what, what, will prevail. Yeah, so like what's your faith or, yeah, like why do you come to that conclusion as opposed to seeing Sort of Total like a terrible distance. diffusion and the collapse of the yes. U.S. government. Yeah. Well, I did dangerously go on the record saying if the U.S. government survives my lifetime, I'll be stunned. <laughs> so, which I kind of believe. But look, I wrote the book. I wrote the book because I spent it after the Dean campaign and the Obama campaign. I spent like a decade trying to explain to people in charge what the technology means and how you have to understand the way it reshapes power and that people can opt out of things and they can challenge you in ways that were impossible before. And it's like people still are not getting it. And I think it's, I think it's very dangerous to have uh, I mean, the first chapter of my book is a little bit of an alarmist tone about where we're headed. 
because I, I am a little worried. That's why I wrote the book. I could see this going some pretty nasty ways, no doubt. Uh, but ultimately, I feel like the values the country was built on, right? The ideas of the United States, of the ideas of the Bill of Rights, you know, the inalienable rights of men and women, the ideas of representative democracy, the ideas of holding power accountable, of due process, of, you know, all of these ideas which you, which I think of as, in a sense, kind of classical liberalism. These are like, in the, in the scope of human history, these are really hard-won values. There's not a lot of governments in all of human history that really try to, to embrace those values in a real way with, with, with any real success. And so I feel like we have an obligation to human history to figure out how to make this work, even if the forces of our technology and our weapons are railing against us in some way. Well, yeah, it might be a little futile, but we have to. I, I, I need it for my children and grandchildren, if for no other reason, you know. I, I have an obligation to try and make this happen. That's the, that's the answer. Yes, you can see a, you can absolutely see a growing nerd, anarchist future. In some ways, I kind of like that idea. <laughs> uh, I certainly prefer it to the notion of a surveillance state without any accountability, which is what I'm worried about with the NSA, surveillance state with no accountability, and, and power that the government's never had before over its citizens. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we have an obligation to our, to our past, to our history, and to our future to, to forge ahead, to figure out how to make this work, to be very clear-eyed, clear-eyed about the challenges that we're facing, but also to, to tackle them with, with enthusiasm and, and it, maybe not optimism, but hope. A sense of history. You know, I just had a comment that maybe we're headed more toward a digital bill of rights, which is not, not a term that I can, but I know that I read an article today about um, some of the world's most um, authors who are, are trying to band together and, and um, require a digital bill of rights. Um, I work in the field of privacy, and um, I'm, I'm surprised you didn't include more you touched on it a little bit. Yeah. There is definitely some interesting work being done on digital. There is, yeah, I, I don't know if it's the same effort. I know of one digital bill of rights. There's an organization I'm very fond of called Access Now, accessnow.org, which is sees internet connectivity as a human right, as a necessary part of uh, holding power accountable and creating systems of justice. Um, so I definitely think there are some interesting, um, there are some important things happening there for sure. Yeah, I should include more of that. That's a good idea. Yeah, oh, big data is more complicated. Big data is I don't, I don't know what big data is. That's like a. It's big. It's big, but it's it's, it's like uh, you know it's like. It's a lot less quantifiable and a lot more complicated than big oil, is what I would say. If you're honest, there's a book I recommend called The Filter Bubble by Eli Pariser. It's about, it's a very different way of thinking about big data that's a lot more complicated and interesting. Sir? I want to, uh, I'd like you to share a concern that the, we have this uh, global warming going on and uh, Unquenchable thirst for the uh, fossil fuels. It's causing more and more global warming. I heard something on uh, NPR this morning. You used to be to put a solar array on your roof. You need a degree in uh, electricity and magnetism. And now you just go down to Lowe's Home Improvement and Home Depot and get one. And so 
like uh, micro motors. You have to each uh, household be a uh, home uh, energy source, selling their energy to the grid. Which would be a, I would turn that into an avalanche so that all you know, 2,000 houses in uh, mm. Buckingham County are doing this. Boy, that is an excellent question. Thank you. I guess that's a sign I should wrap it up, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, you can only listen so long, but I can talk forever. Uh, that's a good question. I don't have a good answer to that. How do we how do we reshape? How do we have a kind of massive cultural change about what's acceptable on the energy front? Right. That's what we need. Every household now has dozen recycling. Yeah, that's true. That happened. We start by one household at a time. Yeah, I mean. The amount of behavior change that has happened in certainly the United States in the last 50 years is pretty significant. So hopefully we'll see a lot more of it before it's too late. It's really what, what, we, uh, all right. When Can, we wrap it up now, we'll have some books being signed downstairs. So if you have any last Ooh, uh, uh, <laughs> questions, um, feel free to join Mr. Mealy there. Thank you very much. Thank you.